Right, it's the top of the hour. Hello and welcome to you all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on wherever you are. Welcome to our session number 19 uh, of our special series on COVID-19, the one that we have dedicated to diagnostics uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Anafi Mataka, I'm from ASLM, and I'm delighted uh, to be your moderator today. Um, our topic of the day uh, is the role of public health laboratory networks in COVID-19 testing. The challenges that we get, strategies, lessons learned uh, from the United States of America, which currently, uh, as you are all aware, is probably the epicenter of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of testing has been done uh, to date. Um, recognizing that uh, testing is really um, and continues to be the cornerstone uh, to the response to COVID-19. We feel uh, this is an opportune time to hear uh, from our colleagues from the United States of America. And we are honored to have uh, Ralph Timperi uh, to take us through our session today, which will be uh, made up of a presentation first, followed by questions and, 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 and answer segment. Uh, as the session progresses, kindly put your questions or comments into the chat box and we shall address these uh, at the end uh, of the presentation. This will be a one hour long session, as I have mentioned. Um, just to give you a brief background uh, on our presenter today, Ralph Timperi is a senior uh, advisor for laboratory services, uh, laboratory practice and management at the Association of Public Health Laboratories. Uh, abbreviated as APHL. Ralph holds a Master of Public Health uh, degree from Boston University School of Public Health. As the former director of the Massachusetts State Laboratory Institute and assistant commissioner of the State Health Department, Ralph led state health public health laboratory programs for disease surveillance, laboratory response networks, for biological and chemical threats, reference labs for clinical diagnostics for TB, HIV, and other pathogens of concern uh, in Massachusetts, including uh, newborn screening testing and the FDA licensed manufacture of human vaccines and serums such as DTP and RSP intravenous immunoglobulins. Ralph's international experience in supporting public health uh, laboratory systems includes work in Central America, Asia, Southeast Asia, and primarily in Africa. He was also a co-founder and co-director of the International Institute for Public Health Laboratory Man Management at the George Washington University School of Public Health. Ralph is an ex-official member, uh, board of directors of the African Society for Laboratory Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, help me welcome Ralph uh, to give us our presentation today. Over to you, Ralph. Uh, as Ralph is putting up the screen, uh, I just want to remind uh, you all that we do have simultaneous uh, language interpretation from English uh, to French available. Kindly click the icon of the interpretation and choose the language of your choice um, uh, as we go. Thanks. Ralph, are you there? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Good, okay. Can I <clears throat> share the screen and we begin? Okay, let me get rid of this. Yeah, we are seeing your Dropbox page. There we go. 
Oh, okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, we are seeing the drop, Dropbox Dropbox page, so probably. Uh, Okay. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anafi, and thanks to all the participants for providing the opportunity to share experiences from the U.S. As Anafi mentioned, uh, U.S. is experiencing uh, coronavirus at very high levels in some parts of the country, and testing is ramping up, so there's a lot to learn uh, in facing this pandemic uh, in the United States and elsewhere at this time. And we, we hope to share some information with you that will be helpful in your own settings. It's a brief time we have today and uh, we'll try to go over the following items. Uh, overview of the US lab network, so you can see how we are coordinated and work together. <clears throat> the specific role of public health laboratories. Uh, overview of SARS COVID-2 testing in the US, and then challenges, bottlenecks, and solutions and strategies that we've come up with to work through the problems we have had uh, during the pandemic response. And we'll talk a lot about data management, which is so important, and also working globally together. So first off, to get a sense of how we work uh, in the United States and public health and surveillance of infectious disease issues. These are the primary partners in public health in the United States that I'm showing here. So ASTO is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers or the state chief health officials, usually titled commissioners. Uh, usually within the health departments, the surveillance and epidemiology program uh, a major component also has a not-for-profit organization of epidemiologists, CSTE, Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, and then NHO, which is the local health officers, and APHL, which represents the public health laboratories in the United States. So these are the partners together that cover everything from local town uh, districts, up through states and to the nation, all reporting into CDC uh, for disease uh, reporting. This map uh, just quickly shows the public health aspect of laboratories in the United States. So every state has a, has a public health laboratory. In addition, some larger cities in large counties have also a public health laboratory. The red pins here represent the state public health labs and the blue green color of the uh, city or county public health labs. There are also a few black pins on the map here which represent federal labs such as CDC, EPA, agriculture. All told, the public health laboratory network in the United States is about 110 laboratories representing those aspects. Now the diagnostic laboratory testing capabilities in the United States is quite different than the public health laboratory capacity. So in terms of testing of, uh, for diagnostic purposes, clinical laboratories located in hospitals, about 8,680 of those, commercial laboratories, 5,414, and then physician offices, 106,000 other laboratories, such as small clinics, uh, nursing homes, and so forth, about 53,000. But the vast majority of testing is done in the clinical and commercial laboratories. Uh, as you can see, 55% of the diagnostic testing in clinical labs and 32% in commercial labs and less than 10% in physician office and others. Those smaller laboratories are mostly doing rapid diagnostic tests and referring specimens to commercial or clinical laboratories for a lot of the testing that goes on. So 
these components, the clinical and commercial laboratories and the public health laboratories work very closely together with the state public health agencies and the epidemiologists uh, in managing uh, disease control uh, in the United States. Um, the major components uh, obviously are supporting surveillance and for example, in the public health laboratory, what would be happening Clinical laboratories might be isolating influenza, forwarding some percentage of those specimens to the public health labs for subtyping. And then the public health labs forwarding a, a further subset of those specimens to CDC for genetic analysis. And this is monitoring shifts that might be happening with influenza. Um, the hospital and in uh, Commercial laboratories obviously doing the bulk of the testing, however, as patients are coming into emergency clinics and also uh, other testing sites where specimens may be taken uh, during the various seasons. So um, thinking about the overall system and looking at these components, you really have two distinct roles, but that are closely interdependent and working closely together. Uh, so the coordination is critical here. Clinical and commercial labs doing the bulk of diagnostic testing, some reference testing, and obviously medical management of patients. Public health labs, on the other hand, are doing primarily surveillance and monitoring testing, some diagnostic testing, and reference testing for the testing that's going on in the clinical and, and commercial labs, uh, and responding to public health needs for testing. So, um, for example, uh, reviewing, uh, reviewing the influenza isolates for COVID-19 uh, testing that's going on, uh, the hospital, clinical labs, commercial labs are doing the bulk of the testing. The public health laboratories are doing targeted testing to identify developing hotspots, movement of the virus, as well as overseeing quality control and monitoring uh, all of the components that are going into the testing. This is just a list to get an idea of in the, in the public health network, there's also laboratories that are designated for special purposes so that we can share resources. So for example, there's an influenza network, there's a antimicrobial resistance laboratory network. So there may be five state public health laboratories that are taking in specimens from all of the regions to track microbial resistance. And these networks make best use of all of the limited resources that we have in the public health laboratories and provide ongoing uh, real-time data to CDC for monitoring changes and, and uh, emergence of certain problems. So in terms of surveillance for SARS-CoV-2 virus, virus uh, the public health testing. Uh, obviously, we have to think about the whole range of information and data that are needed on coronavirus. Uh, the number of cases from asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic to, to hospitalized to fatal cases, who's infected, which areas and which people are infected either age-related or other risk factors of disease, um, and doing testing broadly to determine uh, the spread of the virus as it's moving. Um, I've put up here uh, a publication which you can get on the web and download for free. Uh, it's in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and defining the epidemiology of COVID-19 studies needed by Mark Lipsitch and et al. Uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, 
is information is there so you can look that up and and uh, use that it's a very good reference for looking overall at the types of testing needs that are required to manage an outbreak epidemic uh, pandemic This is just a slide I um, wanted to throw up here quickly because to recognize the importance of uh, the work that we're all doing in preventing the virus from spreading. Obviously, we have a pandemic and the virus has spread globally to almost every country in the world. Um, and the purpose of the laboratory is obviously to detect and track this virus so that the means that we have to slow down its spread and to uh, bring this under control uh, relies on laboratory testing. And this is a, a map of an estimated model of the earliest infections in the US that was done by uh, Northeastern University showing how you know virus that was tested genetically to see what the origin was were coming from Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world, coming into many different locations in the United States. So obviously, once again, port points out the importance of uh, testing broadly and uh, obviously looking at all areas and all risk factors to try and understand where we have to put our resources for prevention. So in terms of the public health laboratories, as I said, we have a defined special role. And I wanted to look at some of the key factors for timely and effective response to outbreak risks. So I've listed here four key factors. One, quality management system. Uh, two, define testing turnaround time. Uh, also, it's an aspect of quality, but a very key aspect. Also coordination within the network and the system capability and capacity. So here are some examples of those essential system components quality indicator examples. Uh, public health laboratories uh, serve as the validation uh, laboratories for the kits uh, for molecular testing. Validation, I think, as everyone knows, uh, of initially of the CDC uh, coronavirus panel uh, failed validation and then corrective action sub subsequently passed. Uh, kit was adjusted and was found to be valid for testing. It's now about 90% of the testing that's being done in the public health laboratories uses the CDC diagnostic panel, as well as many other panels that are available for testing. Um, other types of Quality assurance activities the laboratories do is checking all of the various uh, reagents and supplies that come in uh, related to COVID testing and have detected problems such as contaminated viral transport medium. So these kinds of events become common or too common, more common than we'd like when we have situations like pandemics and epidemics that strain the supply system and new manufacturers come online that may not have experience in providing certain types of materials. For example, producing viral transport media and sterile working conditions. So everything that goes into the test system should be quality assured, verified or validated depending on uh, whether it's been used before and what, what is known about the production of the products. We also have uh, what we call our APHL community of practice. So we have an online system where the lab directors can communicate immediately with all of the lab directors in the United States and share information if they're doing a validation on a new kit 
uh, PCR kit, they share that information. If they find problems in testing, they share that information immediately. So there's daily activity on this uh, community of practice website that's secure. And this aids everybody in solving problems in their laboratories since they have the advantage of information from every public health laboratory in the US at, at their fingertips. So the turnaround time issue that I mentioned in, and in a previous uh, presentation on this series by Professor Peeling, um, she explained diagnostic purposes. And the use case for a test must be understood to know how to manage a specimen and so select appropriate testing conditions. So for example, contact tracing to prevent spread of infections. If the turnaround time of a test is seven days in connection to with a potentially exposed person takes further time, a correct test does not guarantee the desired outcome, which is finding people who are potentially exposed quickly, testing them and determining whether they need to be quarantined or uh, work at home or whatever the appropriate action is based on the result of the test. And to repeat what was in uh, Professor Peeling's uh, presentation, the mantra of the laboratory, right test, right person, right place, right interpretation, right time. So clearly <clears throat> turnaround time has to be defined in specifically and you, we have to meet that. We wouldn't report a test where the control was three standard deviations away from the expected value. And we shouldn't be reporting tests that are intended to prevent spread of infection for follow-up on uh, tracing of contacts. We shouldn't accept a test that's done uh, days or weeks after the person was identified as infected. In terms of communication and collaboration, <clears throat> APHL organizes weekly meetings. Uh, we have an all public health laboratory call with FDA and CDC to discuss current issues. Um, an all laboratory call separately with FDA. And then as I mentioned before, community of practice, uh, real-time communication among all of the lab directors. APHL also set up an emergency operations center. This is something that we have protocol for and implement as needed. And the incident command system for COVID-19 was set up in uh, January for 24 seven operations. And uh, January 21st, this was activated. And this is what it looks like. And we have people working 24 seven to obtain information, communicate with the public, communicate with all of the major players, federal laboratories, CDC, FDA, and so forth. <clears throat> so this is a, a way that we assure that information moves quickly and shared with everybody that needs it. In terms of the activities of APHL in the laboratories, we're also very concerned with all of the issues of testing services, staff, instruments, supplies, facilities, access to services, of course, specimen transport, and strategic and funding implementation plans. And a data management, which is particularly important with lab information systems and connectivity. Now I wanna discuss briefly also some of the ac actions and uh, innovations that have come about within the public health laboratories to address the challenges that we have in the United States in terms of the disease prevalence and incidence at the moment. First, to remind everyone the capacity and capability of testing in the United States about 12%, this is current COVID-19 testing results, about 12% of the tests 
are done by public health laboratories. So uh, on this particular week, uh, the report for that particular week, there were about 225,000 tests done by public health laboratories, about 115,000, 6% done in the clinical laboratories, hospital laboratories, and 82% a million, 1.5 million tests done in the commercial laboratories. Now, these are, for weekly results, and indicate a very high level of testing being done. However, uh, still not adequate in, when you look at the turnaround times, uh, the state labs had ramped up testing from week one to this current week 26 here in there isn't a backlog of, of, of specimens at the public health labs at the moment. There is, however, a backlog of specimens at the commercial laboratories. So they are tasked with doing the bulk of the testing and with the rapid increase in incidence and uh, positivity of coronavirus uh, becomes a very difficult challenge to ramp up, scale up testing on a weekly basis to meet these needs. So this is a real issue of concern and one that everyone is working hard to develop uh, additional ways to scale up testing. And we'll talk about that in a, in a few moments. Uh, scale up testing to stay ahead of the curve. And obviously it's, what's required in order to slow down the, the spread of the infection. Here, here we see uh, a graph, bar graph showing the types of act, actions that the public health labs have taken to keep up with the uh, additional workload from coronavirus. Uh, most laboratories, 86% have gone to testing six to seven days a week. And also in terms of increasing the capacity of the laboratory, they're operating multiple shifts, 47%. Nearly half of the labs are running multiple shifts so that you can get an extra run on the instruments. Uh, <clears throat> so you might get two full runs on your molecular diagnostic instrumentation during a regular work day. And by running another shift, you can put in another uh, run that would come off the following morning. So you get able to get three entire runs in for the day. Uh, obviously, moving from uh, manual testing uh, to highly automated testing, uh, at all phases of the process uh, will speed up testing and increase capacity. Uh, using additional test types to guard against outages in the supply chain. So getting uh, reagents uh, from multiple uh, providers uh, and using different systems uh, for the molecular testing is, is a way to guard against that. Although for some of the components of the test, uh, they're common to all of the test procedures, for example, swabs, and that has been a major challenge in keeping the supply of proper, properly made and sterile swabs for use in the, in the collection of specimens since all of the test systems require the specimen to be taken that way. Uh, also hiring new personnel and, and acquiring new equipment. These are uh, means and, and strategies to increase productivity, capacity of testing. However, they're slower to implement, obviously. Uh, finding available equipment to procure and moving through the procurement system uh, in, in the states in hiring personnel requires time. Uh, obviously moving staff around uh, from other laboratories uh, into the molecular laboratory, virology laboratory for this is, is an option, but 
once again, it stresses other testing services. <clears throat> One of the unusual outcomes of the pandemic, at least in the United States, has been a dramatic decrease in people going to hospitals uh, for treatment uh, and reduction, therefore, in the testing that's being done by these commercial labs and the hospital labs for things other than COVID. And this has actually put a real strain on the hospitals in terms of maintaining their capacity because they don't have revenues coming in. Just a picture here, which is showing uh, what's happened, another, you know, act, another uh, strategy to guard against uh, testing slowdown has been using increased uh, number of test kits, for example, uh, CDC test kit, Kyogen, Thermo Fisher. So what you see here, the red line is week one and the blue line, blue green line is week nine. And you can see that starting off uh, that the uh, majority of, of people were, were using uh, just one test kit. And then uh, over, over time, uh, the, uh, you see the red line uh, at week nine, nearly 40% of the people by using two test kits and, uh, and about 20% of the people using three different test kits. So this is a, a strategy that's been used to assure by tapping into multiple supply chains uh, for, for the testing services, we're able to keep, keep up the capacity of the testing demand. This is a picture of uh, what's known as AIMS, A-I-M-S, the APHL Informatics Messaging Platform. And this is a very key aspect of um, providing timely testing services. Uh, what this does is it enables interoperability across multiple different platforms. So public health labs, clinical care providers have a common lab web portal that they can input into. And that information goes to the public health agencies. Uh, public health agencies are also receiving testing results from uh, various commercial labs and eventually perhaps from individuals through self-reporting applications. All of this is managed uh, through AIMS and through a very complicated system of processing these messages and processing COVID-19 test data, uh, resulting in very rapid transfer of information to CDC. Uh, so this, this assures the uh, validity of the data it, in the processing, it deduplicates information when you have multiple test reports on the same individual uh, and obviously provides everything in an electronic digital uh, basis so that people aren't uh, having to work with pieces of paper coming off of fax machines or in the mail and having to record information into your system uh, manually off of paper. This is just to go back to the earlier slide and uh, when we talked about the public health labs to show, uh, yes, uh, good effort in, in increased capacity of testing for the public health labs, but it takes time. So this, this is an important aspect to look at uh, in the coming months about how scale up can be accomplished more quickly. So you see here uh, approximately a threefold increase from week one 
in terms of uh, public health laboratory testing capacity up to week 11. Uh, but for a disease, a respiratory infectious disease like COVID-19, that's too slow. For some uh, diseases, this would suffice and would be able to control it. But for, for this pandemic, uh, we're gonna have to think of ways to ramp up testing uh, even more quickly than was done uh, here. And also obviously with the commercial labs because they provide the bulk of the testing for the United States uh, and the public health labs serve those particular uh, niches of testing that we described uh, before. I want to give you one, sm one small example of uh, the District of Columbia lab laboratory, uh, that's Washington, D.C., uh, and how they went <clears throat> through several steps to ramp up their testing capacity. Uh, to meet the demand. Uh, and they were looking at data that was developed by modelers saying how much testing capacity they needed in the District of Columbia. They looked at what they were doing at that point in time with, with a Kyogen testing system, uh, mostly manual system and uh, doing extractions and testing uh, for staff persons and what could be accomplished there were extraction of 180 uh, specimens uh, and the output one has to remember it's when we look at these things for planning purposes lots of samples have to be uh, run for quality control uh, and these molecular tests so the output is actually only 50 uh, patient specimens in a day for all of this equipment. And after four steps in ramping up, they now are sitting running uh, the Hologic Panther Fusion, which they began running uh, March 30th. So in a very short time, four weeks, they went from the 50 samples today per day to uh, up to 500 samples per day and doing that by using uh, an additional shift so they could run that third run uh, at the end of the day. <clears throat> so this is one example of how each lab in, in their setting has to analyze what the requirements are for their populations and then find solutions uh, and, and implement those quickly as they can. DC also implemented uh, a mobile unit, which was borrowed from uh, the CDC. And this mobile testing unit is running Abbott ID Now tests, and it goes out to nursing homes and uh, other sites where people uh, can't go to a hospital or a clinic uh, for testing. So we bring the testing to them and the turnaround times in the ID now is very short, uh, about an hour, and they can get in about 50, uh, in a four hour cycle, get in about 50 people tested with results same day. And that's provided to the medical staff of the nursing home then follows up with the individuals. I have three slides here that I'm going to look at uh, just to emphasize the issue with the different roles of the laboratories and what that looks like in practice. <clears throat> this is the this is the public health laboratories and you can see the increasing uh, output capacity of testing, numbers of specimens tested over the weeks. You can also see by age group uh, the positivity of, of specimens. And you can see them peaking uh, and then 
this is on a national basis, uh, number of positivity falling down. Now this is, this is uh, an average of the national, and we know, uh, and as you're probably aware, there are spikes of uh, incidents. Uh, it's not the same, it's not homogeneous across the country, so there's some areas that are showing uh, peak moving towards a new peak of uh, infections uh, this late in the in the pandemic. So this is what the public health laboratory looked like, and you can see it starting up uh, early early on in in the pandemic testing. Here's, here are clinical laboratories, and you can see there's a bit of a shift here. Uh, because uh, people aren't showing up to the hospital right at the front part of the spread of the virus. Um, and then moving up very quickly and their specimens tested at a very high level. And the commercial laboratories. So here's the challenge. This is where the bulk of the diagnostic testing is having to be done. And this happens uh, through specimens being collected in hospitals, even some public health laboratories sending commercial labs tests to be done, uh, drive-in clinics, walk-in clinics, uh, it, small uh, nursing centers, uh, boards of health across the entire country. So these commercial laboratories have collection sites and they're bringing in thousands and thousands of specimens. As you can see, they're well over on this graph, well over 2 million tests in a week. Uh, still not enough, uh, but you can see the challenge here and the level of testing that has to be done. And it's being uh, stressed not, not only uh, because of uh, the spread of the virus, but the increased incidence is is happening uh, in a very wide area. Uh, so this is this is challenging the specimen transport systems as well as the testing systems and well as the reporting systems and getting the data back to the health departments. So I wanted to take a few minutes now to look at a couple of the ways where we've been able to make a significant impact on uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of the testing. This is, and this certainly is something that has relevance globally. So paper or electronic test orders. This is, this is a root cause of many of the issues with uh, specimen testing backlogs. Let's consider if you had 50 clinics and each day they took in 15 specimens for testing. And let's estimate that uh, 45 minutes was required to process each of those specimens into their system. So then that paper test request ends up at the laboratory at some point in time, which means there are 750 test requests on paper at these laboratories. And the laboratory now has to input that into their lab information system. So what took a clinic 45 minutes now translates into the laboratory that received the specimen Spalley's clinics to 37 and a half hours time to process a whole week Obviously, this could be solved in different ways, but none of them are easy. You could have five people hired into the laboratory to process specimens. It's a challenge with finances and finding staff available quickly enough. Uh, you could uh, find other ways to do that, but the efficient way to do this is an electronic test order request. So if you capture the information at the clinic level and that goes uh, to into the lab information system, the specimen receives a barcode as well as a patient name and number. 
but the barcode is scanned in at the laboratory, that's all that's required to match that specimen up with the uh, patient information that's been inputted into the system. So now you're processing the 750 specimens in about 120 minutes or two hours. So I put a big star on this one because this is absolutely one of the biggest challenges that has a solution, but one of the biggest challenges that's causing specimen backlog in many, many countries. Here's a picture of uh, the setup, for example, APHL working in, in Mozambique with the National Institute there and the, the uh, national uh, laboratories at all levels. So this is just a diagram of an example, but we've got clinics, which are shown at the top of the diagram there with the computers submitting test order requests electronically. Those are going to the testing laboratories, uh, central lab uh, uh, server, and they pick up that test order. They match it up with the specimen. When the specimen arrives in the laboratory, run the test. That test result is then, since you now have an electronic electronic connectivity at the clinic, the test result is sent back immediately to the uh, to the clinic that submitted that specimen. And the test results are also moved into a central laboratory repository that maintains all of the tests over time. And this central data repository can be used for many purposes for reports going to the epidemiology surveillance program for use in a dashboard uh, uh, presentation of information on a re near real-time basis for testing results. Uh, so this, this is uh, really something that should be made a requirement and is a ready-made so ready solution for one of the biggest root causes of specimen backlogs. Um, and now I want to talk about specimen pooling, which is a, a very important opportunity for uh, managing increased specimen testing. Uh, what I'm going to show you is what was done at the University of Nebraska Medical Center with the Nebraska Public Health Laboratory. And <clears throat> This is also a published work and I'll show you the reference for that shortly. Uh, the study was led by Baha Abdal Hamid and um, so in order to do the, the uh, pooling, what they did was uh, they used an application that's available uh, on the web. It's called the Shiny application. And <clears throat> it takes, it's an algorithm that uses estimated uh, prevalence of the disease and the sensitivity and specificity of the test that you're using. And with that information, it projects out uh, the reduction in expected numbers of tests so that you can select uh, the most appropriate pool size. So what they came up with, uh, the, other, the other factor, so it's sensitivity, specificity, uh, and limit of detection, as well as prevalence of the disease. And the, plug that, that information into the algorithm, they came up with uh, pool size of five specimens uh, being uh, the most uh, effective for reducing uh, reducing the personnel time and uh, use of reagents. Um, so they they ran first some prepared specimens uh, to look at this, and then they ran some. Uh, 
actual individual specimens coming into the hospital and found complete agreement uh, with uh, the numbers of positive specimens. And when they ran a pool that was positive and then they broke that down into the individual specimens, they found the single positive specimen. They didn't find uh, any pool that had two positives, but that would certainly be possible. But looking at pooling five specimens for a test, they were able to decrease their use of kit resources by 68%. So this, this would say even, even if you didn't have a problem with backlog and even if you didn't have a problem with the demand exceeding your testing capacity, it would seem uh, a wise thing to consider spec uh, pooling specimens for testing because of the savings in personnel time and reagent use. Um, so just a summary, uh, you're able to conserve reagents and personnel time. You can determine the optimal pool size for your particular situation and this procedure has been well validated by the group in uh, Nebraska. Here's the reference, uh, and I know that these presentations are made available later, so you can pull this off later if you need to, but this is published in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology, June of this year. Uh, this is the email address of the senior author on the paper and the web application is found at this location. So I want to <clears throat> stop there and hopefully have generated some good questions coming from the participants and I'm happy to say that uh, I think we know what needs to be done in the U.S. and uh, working towards uh, improving uh, and increasing the capacity of the testing services as well as the public health laboratory collaboration and cooperation with all of the laboratories in the United States. And of course, remain interested in working globally with all laboratories who are faced with this challenge during the pandemic. And we have staff working in several of the countries in Africa as well as involved in other areas in the world. So this is the really the role of APHL is to support public health laboratories in the United States, but also to share what we do in the United States globally. So let me stop there, Anafi, and see if there have been questions coming in on the... On the... Uh, thank you very much, Ralph, uh, for the wonderful and very informative presentations presentation and um, indeed there are quite a lot of questions uh, hopefully we managed to tackle some of them uh, for those that will not manage I uh, will ask you to help us respond to them in writing and we will be able to share uh, after this session uh, in a couple of days let me take the first question from Samuel Taiwo uh, and he says what are the roles of research laboratories in research institutions and universities in the current COVID-19 pandemic? And how did they coordinate or integrate with the public health uh, diagnostic laboratories? So uh, I'm, I'm assuming enough the special laboratories are, we're talking about university-based? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, those laboratories pl are playing an important role in, in the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, they often play a role in epidemic responses because of their uh, expertise and experience. Uh, and uh, with COVID-19, because of the level of challenges happening, they're actually being, being drawn into a very direct role. Uh, for example, it, of the, we have uh, some of the university based laboratories working directly to support a county or state health uh, system response in testing, diagnostic testing. Uh, 
but often what they're the role that they're playing is working working up new test procedures uh, working up uh, information uh, on the nature of the organism that will be helpful in treatment for physicians so they they have some overlapping roles with the public health laboratories and the clinical hospital laboratories. And depending on the, the level of the outbreak and the demand, they often sometimes step in to work directly with the public health labs and testing. For example, when I was in Massachusetts, uh, at times we would have testing being done on some of our specimens at a, at a uh, academic lab or they would be sending staff to our laboratory to work. So it's really a range of things that they do to fit the need and bring their special expertise to assist there. Over. Uh, thank, thanks a lot, Ralph. Um, there, there are quite, quite a number of positive uh, messages in the chat. Uh, uh, really good presentation and practical and Mamadou Koita also requested for slides. I uh, just want to inform everyone, as usual, we will be able to share these uh, as, as we always do. Uh, Luhung, uh, uh, it's a very long sentence, Luhung B uh, says, in the USA, uh, do you still use antibody rapid testing for surveillance? Absolutely. Uh there are surveillance studies uh, that have been done and surveillance studies underway uh, using serologic assays. This is a very important aspect, obviously, uh, of surveillance and, and has a, a place in determining prevalence of exposure of individuals. So uh, it's not, obviously, as everyone knows, it's not something that would use to identify infection, current infection, but it's a important uh, aspect of the tools that we have in the laboratory for defining the outbreak and helping uh, guiding public health actions to, uh, to control the outbreak. Thank, thank you, Ralph, for confirming that. Um, there are quite, quite a couple of questions really around the VTM. Uh, so maybe we can address them uh, at the same time. Um, so briefly, this is from Testify. Uh, Abreha says, when you say contaminated VTM, what were specifically the contaminants? Is it contaminated with SARS-CoV-2 and giving false positive results? And uh, yeah. Yeah. also wants to know around the, the, does contaminated VTM affect quality of results? Uh, then I think Rando probably same around contamination. Uh, if it is discovered, what are the actions that are taken? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, we're talking about back, excuse me, bacterial contamination, environmental bacterial contamination, and there were several different uh, bacteria that were found in in one or more of the tests. Uh, with, with uh, lots of uh, viral transport medium. This seems to be associated with <clears throat> producers who come online, new, new companies that haven't done these kinds of operations in the past and maybe don't know all of the requirements to produce sterile, uh, sterile materials. Uh, so it's part of the uh, role of our public health laboratories to be doing quality assurance across the board on all of the materials and uh, discovered this obviously uh, a, a very, very large problem. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, you know, the resolution obviously is the, to answer the question, of course, it would affect uh, the, the testing results and uh, is problematic in that that, that case. Uh, resolving the issue with the manufacturer is a bit more complicated and I don't think we need to get into that. But I, I think the point is that 
you must be verifying and validating anything coming into the laboratory. When you receive a new lot of material, a reagent of some sort, you need to make sure that it performs the way it should. Some, you can't do uh, contamination testing on everything, but you need to sample. Uh, usually the, the, the viral transport media is used for the swabs, you use you know, large numbers of tubes. So you could sample, come up with a sample number that would be uh, adequate to test uh, and make sure that this was sterile material before you went forward. If you're dealing with a new supplier, if you're dealing with a known supplier <laughs> that you've been using over time and you're sure that they have good manufacturing procedures, obviously you don't have to do that on all the cases, but we've had to step in, for example, with serology tests coming out, so many of them, uh, which have turned out not to be reliable. So there's different things that happen and as the pandemic has scaled up and pressuring uh, for more materials, uh, people have stepped up, you know, not, not wanting to, to, to provide a product that's not satisfactory, but people have stepped up probably without the experience to produce materials properly. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, 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 Ralph. Um, there are quite quite a number of questions regarding pooling as a strategy. Um, from Marina and, and quite a lot uh, others that that also came through. And uh, thanks for those that tried also to respond to this, saying it's uh, only a strategy for population screening. Marina says, uh, I know you touched uh, this in your presentation really on your thoughts in the current uh, environment where we, we have shortages uh, of, of supplies. And uh, I will link that to the next question from O Chiang who says, what might be causing the backlog of specimen testing in the US? Could you repeat that last part again? What might be causing the- Backlog of specimens uh, testing, uh, yeah. specimens for testing in the United States. Sure. Sure. So I think pooling is a very important uh, strategy to consider in every laboratory that's doing this testing. Uh, it's certainly, uh, in the case of the Nebraska lab, with their data, with their estimated prevalence rate, and with the sensitivity specificity and limited detection of the, the molecular tests they were using, they were able to uh, come up with a pool size that would work for them of five specimens in a pool. So there was a huge saving in reagents uh, and also personnel time. And this certainly allows you to also process specimens more quickly. So it affects turnaround time dramatically. So the, I think pooling has to go high on the list uh, to, for consideration by any laboratory doing large volumes of testing uh, for COVID-19. Uh, and clearly it, it will work and, and uh, you know, the pool size might be a little different depending on the situation for a given laboratory. Uh, when you look at those uh, uh, aspects of the determinants for the algorithm, but it's probably going to be somewhere near that, four specimens, five, maybe six. Uh, at any rate, I think very, very important to consider. The issue of <clears throat> why a backlog, I, th I think the, um, obviously it's, uh, at one, there's a lot of variability and, and there are backlogs overall in the commercial laboratory, but some commercial laboratories have no backlog or very little, and others have large backlogs. So, uh, you know, the factors that come into play here are the, the incidence of the disease by area and where those, in those areas where those specimens are being sent to which laboratories for testing. So clearly uh, here an opportunity for stepping in. I, I'll come back and, and refer back to what I talked about earlier <clears throat> on uh, coming up with a root cause. So it's 
really the laboratory has to take responsibility for, for delays in turnaround time, even if they're not the source of the delay. So I think when we see turnaround times that are very long for the intended purpose, we have to take the responsibility as laboratorians to do that analysis and find out what, the, which is the question here, what's the cause of that specimen backlog and how, what are the options for fixing it and then bringing that information forward to the appropriate people who can act on it, either providing funding or making policy decisions that will enable the change to happen. And I think, you know, the fact that Commercial laboratories in the United States represent the majority of testing that's done. And in fact, uh, I mean, the one challenge they've had is the, the, the enormous reduction in demand for testing of all types of tests that they would normally run because of the slowdown in hospital activities and uh, requirements uh, due to COVID-19. So the, uh, the laboratories have actually been losing staff initially when this started, and now they're having to scale back up again. So that's, that's one of the challenges. Another one is <clears throat> having, uh, if you remember looking at the, uh, system that uh, APHL has, the information informatics system, using that uh, to feed in the data from the commercial laboratories, as well as the other, the demand side, where the specimens are coming from. This would require uh, new, new operational uh, rules for how to move specimens, but obviously we want to take advantage of every, every uh, capacity that's available at any time. So you really need to know, certainly on a weekly basis, if not more frequently, uh, where the specimens are going and whether or not that's running into a problem uh, with creating that backlog. Um, we've got to move specimens to where the capacity is. But I think the underlying problem is really the resurgence of uh, this disease, the incidents recurring. And so it's very difficult for the system to respond to these enormous fluctuations of demand up and down. Uh, I think the public health laboratories, the commercial laboratories are running often seven days per week and they're running double shifts and uh, it's, it's at their maximum. I think everybody knows where they wanna be for the numbers of tests that they can do. Uh, it's, it's not as simple as saying we need to do more tests. <laughs> this, it's a very complex system to get up and running and to double, triple the throughput on these systems. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, I think we have, uh, I know we have gone beyond time, so we just want to round off. Um, I was about to ask us that we close, but there's a very interesting question that comes through here. Uh, the bulk of testing is done by commercial labs. So Moluken Kaba says, do patients pay for the test or are they funded by government? Um, maybe you could combine that response and uh, maybe add an extra 30 seconds to round off his last uh, remarks. Sure. Uh, so healthcare financing in the United States is a very complex area and uh, I, I don't think I can answer everything on the question uh, specifically as, as people might want, but in general, uh, the test would be paid for. Certainly if the person has health insurance, it would be paid for. And then there's also money that uh, is going into the system from Health and Human Services uh, Agency in the United States directly to hospitals to support testing in, in diagnostic testing, uh, also to, to clinical labs. Uh, in some cases, people, uh, health insurance is often tied to uh, people, individuals' jobs. 
in, with lots of people losing jobs, some of them find the, find themselves in a situation where they might have to pay for a test, but that's the exception. Uh, the most people would find that the test is going to be paid for either by their health insurance company or the government. Uh, thank, thank you, Ralph. Um, it's been a wonderful session. Uh, quite a lot of questions indeed for us to respond to, uh, but the time hasn't been enough. Um, we will get back to you, Ralph, uh, and uh, ask you to help us respond to some of these questions and put them in a Q&A as we usually, we usually, we usually do. Um, I would like to um, just give you one announcement. Uh, our systems are back uh, to normal in Addis. Um, so you should be able to go to our ASLM Academy and um, print out a certificate uh, for this session. And for those that have not managed to attend today, they can still find this session there and uh, able to also follow the presentation um, uh, in, uh, in, in retrospect. Um, other than that, I think uh, it's been a wonderful presentation. Many thanks to Ralph uh, for sharing uh, these insightful um, experiences from the US. And we really appreciate uh, him and colleagues for that. Uh, we will continue bringing this uh, on a weekly basis and uh, watch out for the announcement of the next session. Uh, for now, uh, that's left for me to say goodbye and uh, stay safe uh, till we meet again. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anafi.